it was really hard in the very beginning because you have all this milk and you have to get it into a store. I would knock on the door of every manager in stores and bring in my product and say, try this. Yeah. This is the best milk you ever try. You can drink this milk. It won't hurt your stomach. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. A small family dairy starting up at a time when most of them are closing down or consolidating with bigger dairies. It's a very unusual story. This week, here on the Real Food, Real People podcast, we're at My Shan Dairy in Everson, Washington. I'm Dylan Honkoop, your host, and this is my continuing journey all over Washington State to get to know the real people behind your food. Today, we talk with Shannon Smith of My Shan Dairy right here on the farm. Shannon. Dylan. Thanks for having me here to the oh, farm. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for coming. I haven't been to your farm since you moved here. I've heard oh. about this place. Yes. It's awesome, right up against the mountain here. It's beautiful, beautiful setting right here. Yeah. So this is this is it, my Shan Dairy. It is. Explain what, what you guys do. You're about the Guernseys. These aren't the black and white cows. No, these they are... still have the white splotches on them but they're brown. They are brown. What, what are the Guernsey cows all about? So we chose the Guernsey cow um, for the milk. There's a difference in the milk. I could talk about A2, but they also have beta carotene in their milk. When a cow eats grass um, that has beta carotene in it, mm -hmm. all other cows digest that and it goes out in mm -hmm. their waste. Mm -hmm. Guernsey cows, they cannot digest the, the beta carotene and it goes into their milk instead. Wow. So beta carotene is like what's in carrots, right? Exactly. Like that's good for your eyes and yes, stuff like that, yes. right? It's good for Im immunities. Okay. So, so for, for the Guernsey cow's milk, it gives it just that slightly golden color. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we love about the milk and the taste. Um, it's, it's a little sweeter. Um, it's, it's got more fat and more protein yeah. than, than say the Holstein cow. Nothing wrong with the Holstein cows. Yeah. And he, every, I, every breed of cows is, has their, their spot in right. our world, you right. know? So talk so, about what we have here. Are these the, the milking cows? These are the milk cows. Okay. Um, and we are milking about 65 girls right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Bottling most of it. Any mm. excess that we have goes to Grace Harbor Farms. Okay. And they make yogurt out of it. Um, we also bottle and then we have our yogurt as well. This is the feed. This right? is the like, feed. Um, and what, it, what is in this? This has um, a lot of vitamins, mm -hmm. protein, um, it has silage, and it has hay. Uh, hay, haylage mm. is what we like to call it. Right. Um, the marshmallows that you see yeah. in the fields, um, we put that hay in there wet, and so it ferments and it becomes um, like sauerkraut, which so is I, good. I, that's what I've called it before. It's like yep. cow sauerkraut. Yes, it's good for their stomachs. It, sauerkraut's good for us. It's got probiotics in it, right. and it just makes them healthy. We love to have them in the pasture um, as much as we can. Yep. But, you know, we live in Washington <laughs> where it is wet. Um, and so spring and, and summer and fall, we get them out. We rotationally graze out in the fields, but um, definitely during the winter, they have to be in. And then we get to, to, but we have this feed for them all year round. Yep. So they just supplement and they'll sleep outside because it's during the summer, it's, it's just, it's great to be out on the field. His cows so. like cooler temperatures generally, not like super cold, mm -hmm. but like for, like what it is today is like super it's comfortable perfect. for a cow, right? Perfect for a cow. Yep. Yep. They, but so that's why 
um, during the summer, they'll sleep out at night because it's yeah. out in the pasture because it's cooler. So talk about this building that we're in here. It's, you know, got a, a totally covered by a roof, but the sides are kind of open. Yes. For the wind to, and it's happening right now, it's windy out here. <laughs> the wind is just windy. going right through. So it's very open and airy here. The cows hang out here for the most part. When, when is it that you do put them out on the pasture and, and why wouldn't they be out on the pasture now? Well, the, the ground is too wet to go out on the ground. Um, and if you have something that keeps walking on the same spot every day, um, that eventually ruins the grass um, mm. with it being so wet. Right. So, and the grass for the summer is very important to us. So we, we want um, the, the ground to be dry enough for the cows to go out. It's kind of a so, soil health thing too, yes, right? Because if yes. it's muddy and then trampled, it gets compacted and yep, yep, your soil is Yeah, healthy. and then you just, grass won't grow through that compacted soil. So the and cows so hang out in they here hang in the wintertime. Yes, yes. So as we move over here, what's the, what's the process? Like when it comes time, these cows get milked, what, twice a day? They get twice a day. Yep, they head over. Um, my daughter, my husband got sick three years ago. And so she started milking. She took over the milking for him. And which a year ago, he, he's no longer has any of the symptoms and he's Good. doing very well. Um, but our daughter will come and she'll round up all the cows and then head over to the, to the parlor. They know that there'll be fresh, more fresh feed out once they are done milking. So they want to get in, get milked and come back out and get more feed. So can we go check it out? Yeah. Okay, so we're here, we walked here into the parlor and it's like concrete around the outside and then like a pit down in there with like mat, it looks like work mats. Yep. That's where the milkers actually work, right? Yes, so the cows stay up high and the milkers can work on, you know, getting the machines on their right. teats without having to like bend way down right. and destroy their knees like my grandpa We're, did. Like in the old days, yes, <laughs> yes. Both my grandpas with, with milked flat in barns. flat barns mm -hmm. and their knees were destroyed from it because they did it twice a day for right. 50 years. Right, right, and this is, makes life much easier for the, for the milkers to, to not destroy the knees. Yeah. You know, and it's easy to reach them. Um, there's six on each side, and each each girl comes in. Mm -hmm. um, there's a pre-wash, then they wipe their teats off. Mm -hmm. They put the milker on, and then when they're done, it comes off. And then there is a dip, a post dip, and to, that helps seal the teat so mm -hmm. infection does not come into the teat. Got it. So you so. can have 12 cows being milked in here at the same time. Yes, yes. And this is a very small parlor compared to others. Um, but with milking 65 girls, it's perfect size for us. So this is basically like just gates for them to each have sort of a spot to stand. Yep. And they all stand at an angle. And then there's all these basically hoses and stuff and pipes that actually takes the milk from the udder yes. into the system and over the tank. We'll have to look at we the We have tank a, in a receiving minute. jar. So in the corner of, of parlors, there's a receiving jar. So the milk goes through steel pipes mm -hmm. into the receiving jar from the receiving jar. Then it goes up into, um, f through pipes into the other room, which is the milk house. And that has the great big tank that holds our milk. So these machines here that each by each spot for the cow there's four you know stainless things with kind of a rubber cup on it that's what actually milks the cow it yes yes sucks onto the teat yep. and it, they, it massages the teat and um it it with the massaging that causes the let down the cows will let down their milk and then um yeah it takes about five minutes some are a little slower some are faster are the cows okay with that? Are they comfortable with it? Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't hurt or anything? No, it does not hurt. No, awesome. as, as a 
breastfeeding mom, I can tell you <laughs> that when you when you do that manually, it does not hurt. Yeah, been there, done that. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, yeah. I've done it. So. so this is where the milking actually happens. Yes. How long does it take? It takes a couple hours um, from start to finish, and then, yeah, then clean up. So your daughter does a lot of the milking? Yeah, she does. She does the night milkings. We also have um, another friend, a friend's daughter, mm -hmm. that will help. And then uh, my husband's cousin does the morning milking. So. How early does that start? That starts at three or four o'clock in the morning. Why does it have to be so early? I mean, that's always the thing, right? Like dairy farmers, they get up super early, but why? Why couldn't you start at eight? We could, <laughs> but then we start, the, that would be the evening milking would start at eight. And so it's like 12 hours. It's 12 hours. Between, yeah. Yes. And All so nobody wants to start milking at eight o'clock at night because then you want to wind down and put your kids to bed. I'm a night owl. So that's when I would, <laughs> if, that's when you if would I do had it. a dairy, I'd start milking at eight. Yeah, I'd be yeah. fine with that. So this is, yeah, this is our bulk tank and all of the milk is, goes here mm -hmm. until we need it. And then it goes into, um, goes through more steel pipes right. into our creamery where it, it is pasteurized and bottled. And then otherwise, whatever excess we have, then Grace Harbor will come and they get it from the bulk tank. Yeah, because what I'm used to when I grew up, the milk went into the tank and then, you know, my grandpas, neither of them processed their own milk like no. you guys do. A milk truck would come, pump it into its tanks and take it to town where it would be processed. So when we first started farming in 2009, we had Milky Way come and get our milk yep. and bring it to Dairy Gold. But then when we started processing ourselves, then, then we didn't have that anymore. Um, but... Grace Harbor will come in. right? and they have a small, they have a small tanker. <laughs> yeah. And then well, we had it David away. here on the podcast. I don't remember if we talked about that when we interviewed David for his episode, but oh, okay. I do see him driving. He has his trailer yeah. with his special tank on it and he had to get a special license to be able yes, to haul milk. You, yes. You recall. have to have a milk haulers license to be able to haul milk. So, don't mess around with that no. hauling of milk. <laughs> no, you have to have everything special. So where is your, where do you process the milk? We process right next door okay. from this building on the farm here. If I recall, you kind of do something a little differently there too than yes. the typical milk in the We have the a vat, store. we have a hundred gallon vat. Okay. And so that pasteurizes it for us. Because um, pasteurizing is basically, and you can pasteurize almost anything, right? It's heating right. it to a certain temperature right. for a certain amount of time. 145 degrees for 30 minutes, and then we cool it. And it's a couple hour process mm. for us to do that. And then um, also bottling it takes, a, you know, can take a couple hours as well. So what's the so, advantage to doing that kind of pasteurization, that pasteurization? So it doesn't hurt the enzymes of the milk. Mm. Um, and so, because the faster way of pasteurization is higher temperature, right? Right. right. It's shorter, but higher temperature. And right. that can, that can break down the enzyme of the milk. Um, and we want to keep our milk as close to raw as we can. Mm -hmm. We don't homogenize it. Mm -hmm. We don't separate it. So it strictly goes from cow to the tank into the pasteurizer, into a bottle. That's it. So it's not so, like cream over here, no, skim, thin is, milk over here. There is nothing separated. Mm. So when you take your cream out mm -hmm. of, of your milk, you have to add synthetic vitamins in. Mm. So without that, we don't have to do any, right. any vitamins, nothing synthetic. It's all straight milk from the cow. We'll get back to our visit with Shannon Smith in just a moment, but I do need to thank our sponsors for making this conversation and these visits to farms all over Washington State and other people in our food system all over Washington State possible. Um, they include the Dairy Farmers of Washington. Big thank you to them for being a faithful sponsor of the podcast from the very beginning. Of course, they're all about sharing the real stories of people producing dairy 
in Washington State, the milk and all of the wonderful food uh, that comes from it and, and sharing the sustainability story that goes behind that as well that so many people don't often see about how uh, dairy and milk is really produced here in Washington State. Wadairy.org is their website. And coming up in June is the Whatcom This Way event. You can find out more information on their website, wadairy.org. It's inviting you to dairy farms and creameries and other things like that right here in Whatcom County where I grew up. My grandparents on both sides had dairy farms like the ones that you can visit coming up in June for the Whatcom This Way event. Also, Mana Insurance Group sponsoring the podcast. We appreciate their support. Um, Manainsurancegroup.com, by the way, is their website. They're all about planning ahead, making sure you have that plan, have your ducks in a row. So if and when, and hopefully it doesn't, but if something happens, you're prepared for it and you don't have to pick up the pieces. You already have that assurance that it's going to be taken care of. So check them out, manainsurancegroup.com, um, founded by a high school classmate of mine and, and a group of people that I, I know quite a few of them, really trust those folks um, and really appreciate what they're all about. Um, also, we have to thank Save Family Farming for sponsoring the podcast as well, um, sharing the, the truth about farming in Washington State and and working to protect the future of family farming here in Washington. SaveFamilyFarming.org is that website. Check it out. And particularly right now, check out um, the Barn Lights section. And if you go to the website and see the homepage, you'll see what that's all about. SaveFamilyFarming.org, sponsoring the podcast as well. Okay, now back to Everson, where we're talking with Shannon Smith, of my Shandari. So, how long have you, you said? Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. We started. We started with some jerseys, and then decided to go the with the Guernseys. Um, yeah. And I went to the Midwest and bought seventeen girls at a dispersal sale and brought them back. And then um, the jerseys left, except for anything that was a 4-H project. We did keep, we did keep the kids as 4-H projects because, and that was one Holstein and then a couple of jerseys, just because you can't get rid of the kids (laughs) as 4-H projects. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our sons last, our, so, our last 4-H project yeah. was supposed to go and be called, and my husband could not do it. <laughs> she did not head onto that truck. <laughs> she is still here. So she's a pet. She's probably going to go to our house and, <laughs> and live a good life because, you know, those 4-H projects, they just have a special place in your heart. So... So who decides to start dairy farming? I mean, the, the backstory, the context is, you know, so many people are getting out of dairy farming and the dairy farms that are still around seem to keep getting bigger and bigger to just be able to survive all of the pressures and find efficiencies. In the midst of all this, you guys are starting your own small family dairy farm, which is a rarity now. Yeah, it's almost kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Why why did you decide to do it? Our kids were were showing dairy cows Mm -hmm. um, 4-H. And once they had a calf, what do you do with them? You know, kids didn't want to sell them. So you'd find a friend that, can you house my cow? Will you milk her? You know? Right. And after a while, there were several of them housed here, housed there. What do you do? So you guys weren't on a farm at that point? No, we weren't. But my husband's grandpa had a dairy farm okay. that n- that there were no cows. Um, the house was being rented out. Um, he was very elderly. Mm-hmm. And so we decided, you know, we'd start up there. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we started. And then um, it was time for the, ha- he had passed away. It was time for the house to, 
and property to sell. Mm -hmm. So we had to find a place to rent. Yeah. And so that's where we, we started um, on the Wiser Lake Road. And from there we went to um, the H Street Road and now to here here in Everson. That so, can't be an easy job to move an entire dairy operation. No, Not no. just loading up the cows into trailers, but all the equipment, no. all the tools, all, I can't no, imagine. No, a parlor setup. Yeah. I mean, you have to completely set up a whole new parlor. And so that, I mean, that's dairy tech at your doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> when we yeah. moved here, um, it was in April of 2020, yeah. and they had like 15 dairy tech trucks or vans here and I just I just kept hearing cha-ching cha-ching <laughs> cha-ching every time that one rolled in I was like oh you guys should go home <laughs> this is getting expensive <laughs> yes yes it's Friday you should go home <laughs> now there had been a dairy operating here before yes. you guys though, yes right? yes but we had to not only move the dairy here yep. but we also had to move our, our bottling facility ah, as well. Yeah, which they weren't doing here before. No, right. and so we had to move a building onto the property and the steel pipes, we needed more steel pipes <laughs> from the parlor, you know, into the, into the milk house, from the milk house into the, the bottling room. So it was all about setting that up and that was a big thing for Dairy Tech and getting the parlor up to what we wanted, the, what we were used to, how we were used to milking. So let's go way back. Like, is there fam, family farming background here? It sounds like you said so your husband's my husband, grandpa. My husband's grandpa. Um, my husband grew up on that farm. It was on the Hampton Road. Mm -hmm. um, it was DeGroveview Dairy, um, the DeGroats. And so he, when we started dating, he'd tell me he'd pick me up at six o'clock for dinner <laughs> or a movie or whatever, whatever it was that right. we were going to go do that night, that right. Saturday night. And six o'clock would come and 630 would come and seven <laughs> o'clock would come. Well, back then, you know, that was in the late 80s and there were no cell phones. Right. There was a, a phone in the milk house. <laughs> But yeah. he never used it to call my house and say, you know what? <laughs> Nobody came in to relieve me to milk. <laughs> so I've got to finish. And, and, and yeah. Anna Mae isn't here yet. <laughs> and so I'm still milking. No, he never told me that. So he would show up, you know, an hour or two hours. I should have known back then that what trouble I was going to get myself in because, because the farming doesn't leave you. Yeah. I, my husband could never get rid of it. And being in the funeral industry as mm -hmm. we are, yep. um, he needs that, that time to get away. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. is with his, with his four-legged girls. Yeah. He gets to come out to the farm, um, stress relief. So he grew up around this small farming community. Yes. Same community I grew up in. in Me Linden. too. And, but, and he grew up around farming. Yeah. But then he went, because his dad, I remember the mortician, Don Smith, yeah. funeral yeah. director for a long time. And he followed in his father's footsteps and yes. became a funeral director. Yes. Yes. And so that's his professional side. Yes. And that makes sense because I've always wondered, how do people who do that, taking care of families that are mourning, what, what do so, other funeral directors do if they don't have a farm uh, or something? Know, like, I mean, this is a lot of work, but I can see where it's a huge outlet when your job is around heavy stuff all the time. Yeah, I, I, I can't tell you what other, hmm. what other funeral directors you know, do, but this is, this is what Mylan's relief is. Well, we need to have him on the podcast. Out. Funeral director and farmer at the same time. That's it's, fascinating. It's, it's just, they don't go together. And when people, <laughs> people ask, what do you do for a living? And he'll say, well, I'm a dairy farmer slash funeral director. <laughs> Nobody gets it. But if you were to walk in his shoes for a day and be with, it's one thing when you mourn, like your grandma, right. who's lived a really long life. Right, true. It's, it's another thing when you're, when you're having to take care of a family that's mourning, you know, a child that was lost and the child's only six years old 
or a 20-year-old kid that's passed away. Gut punch. Those ones are so, so gut-wrenching. Yeah, it's... Even though you may do it every day and it's your job and you probably have to keep a certain emotional separation just to cope. Right, but I cry. Still. I just cry anyway. Mm. I cry at the funerals, it doesn't matter. And I... So I you had, help with that business too. I do help with that business. Uh, so I was a nurse for almost 30 years okay. and I retired in 2020. Okay. So... Um, and then I just moved over to the, to the um, funeral home and helped mm -hmm. Mylan with that. But then I'm here on the farm too. Mm -hmm. So you never know what hat you're going to get for the day. <laughs> so today, though, I babysat grandkids. So Tuesdays <laughs> are grandkid day. That's so. another awesome thing about yeah. farming, though. I mean, the flexibility is good and bad because the flexibility can mean cows are out at two o'clock in the morning yeah. and you have to deal with it. Right. But flexibility can mean on a gorgeous afternoon, you can play with your grandkids. Exactly, and and you just never know. Fridays I'm bottling milk, Saturdays I could be delivering. I do delivers on Sundays. I mean, it, it's you just never go, go. know what yeah. what I'll be doing that day. So your husband grew up around farming. What about yeah. you? No. Not at all. No. Grew up in a farming community, Linden. Right. Um, right. So down the road, there's a, there was a farm in every direction. But you were one of those town kids, huh? Yes, I was. <laughs> yes. I had a dog and a cat, and that was it. Um, but I always had a love for animals. Yeah. And... My husband just worked on me long and hard. He <laughs> wanted a dairy farm for a long time. Yeah. And he kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. And finally, finally I gave in. And that was that moment in 2009? Well, I think it was more like 2008 yeah. um, that, you know, he worked hard and hard and long. And, and then finally in 2009, it was, it, it came together. So initially, what was the... What was the vision? What, what did you guys set out to do? It was, when we first started, it was just to milk the cows that our kids had. Mm. Um, it wasn't going to be that big. We needed enough to be able to support itself. Right. But not too much because we both had different careers. Right. I mean, Mylon was a funeral director. I was a nurse. You know, we both worked full time. Yeah. And we had four kids. So... You know, it was just enough. And then Mylon was like, you know, I've always wanted to bottle our own, in my own milk, you know, mm -hmm. do this own processing thing. And so I did a lot of research into it and then applied for a grant. And so the grant helped us get yeah. started. Yeah. And that's complicated, right? Because especially, I mean, there are a lot of aspects, but especially food safety, because you have to be so careful yep. and follow so much protocol yep. to make sure that milk is clean and healthy and all that good stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, to me, setting up that process, it's, especially from scratch, that's just, it's that's mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling, but others have done it before us, so. What was the biggest thing with that? What, what was the hardest thing the to hardest thing? figure out? I, I guess if he did his research he and did knew his research. all the pieces. He did. He, he, and, and he was the one that had to do it because it was his passion. Right. So the Guernseys were my passion and, and the, the creamery was his passion. So. so when did you first start bottling your own milk and selling it to people? That was in 2014. Okay. So we had gotten the grant in 2013, 2014. Man, well, time flies. Yeah. What was that like to start selling the milk that you guys grew from the crops that your cows were eating and the hay that you fed them, taking care of the cows, milking them, processing it, putting it in a bottle? So it was really hard in the very beginning because you have all this milk and you have to get it into a store. Mm. And so it was me. I would knock on the door of every manager in stores and bring them my product and say, try this. Yeah. This is the best milk you ever try. Can I get it into your store? And it was just, it was working hard. Um, on the, the pavement. Yes. Is that uh, like cold calls or how? Yeah, no, I just walk in and, hope that the manager was still there. 
Yeah, that's what I did. A lot of people think about that too. Oh, you, you make some food, you know, whether you grow it, a veggie or meat or milk, and they sell it at the store. But that's a whole world unto it. Well, you have, your sister is in that world, yes, right? She's yes. in the grocery business. Yes, so, but she wasn't in the grocery business when we started. Mm. But when she, when they started their grocery outlet in Linden, mm -hmm. um, we were still not in the grocery outlets. Mm. Um, but when she came, she said she didn't want to open store unless we had the milk in. So we signed with Grocery Outlet like six o'clock the night before they opened their store. So that but was that, quite a but deal. But that shows the whole system. I mean, just because your sister and brother-in-law were opening this grocery store didn't mean they could just put whatever nope. milk they wanted in the cooler. That's part of this company has a relationship with this provider and yep. supplier and there yep. and there there's like shelf space that like different companies kind of have a claim and, on. And right? yes, and so you don't just have an empty no, part of the shelf to put more stuff on if you have it. And doors would be closed in, you know, on me because they would say, I'm sorry, but we don't have the shelf space to, to add to you. And tell, but later on, they would call me back and say, oh, you know, <laughs> I'd like to put your milk in my store. And I'd be like, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> so what, what, how were you trying to sell that idea to them? Because to them, they're probably like, no, I don't want more, one more thing to deal with. What were you trying to, you're trying to say, hey, we have a product here that's different. And, and my difference is the A2. Okay. Um, and you, you mentioned that earlier. Explain yes. what A2 so means. A2 is a different protein mm -hmm. than what other breeds of cows have. They have an A1. And all cows used to have A2. But when they, um, so somebody along the line in the 1700s decided that they wanted to make the Holstein have more milk. And then- As far as which yeah, cows, you know, yeah, the breeding process, yes. just like we have all our different breeds of dogs and cats and right. same with cows. And it changed the protein that the cow produced. Mm. And so it would, it's called an A1 protein. Mm. Um, and so that, so people say they're lactose intolerant yeah. and they're not because lactose is sugar. Mm -hmm. If you can eat a candy bar, your lactose doesn't bother you. It's the protein in the milk that bothers you. An A1 protein irritates the stomach, the lining of the stomach. Mm. And so when you drink a glass of milk and it's A1 and you go, oh, and they run off to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. That so some people are sensitive. It's not necessarily to the lactose. No. It's to this protein. So Guernsey's, 90% of Guernsey's produce A2 milk naturally. Mm. They, that, they, it, it never changed. Mm. So with that, um, it's the same protein as breast milk, human breast milk. It's the same mm. protein as, as goats. Mm. And so if somebody can drink goat's milk, they can drink our milk because it's the same exact protein. So you were going to stores saying, hey, here's a milk that doesn't have anything synthetic done to it. It's totally right. natural, but it's something that people with this issue can still can consume still do. without yes. a problem. Yes. And I was like the Costco lady to, <laughs> to, to find customers. What, like doing samples and stuff? I had to go into stores, <laughs> set up my table, <laughs> and give samples and people be like, oh, I can't drink milk, it hurts my stomach. And I was like, you can drink this milk, it won't hurt your stomach. Wow. So, and, and I would have people say, okay, well, I'm gonna try it. And if it hurts my stomach, I'm coming back to talk to you. They'd never come back. <laughs> so, did, but does a grocery store manager or a grocery buyer, did, did they, were they aware? I think there's more and more awareness of this issue. Yes. I've seen other people doing it and even on a larger scale, like I've talked with the folks before at Alexander Farm down in yes. California. And they've started marketing their stuff all over the place, talking about this A2 idea mm -hmm. and lactose intolerance and maybe there's a, a different option. But at that time, were people like, you're crazy. Like people well, can't drink this. Like, right, if you're they, lactose intolerant, you can't just have milk from Guernsey's. Right. They just nobody. Even they could. People didn't understand it until until you educate them. Yeah. And then some people, I I would just say, you know what, go home, 
and Google it. Google <laughs> A2 milk. Yeah. And then you'll see. And so, you know, when you have some, some other people saying, you know, on, on Google yeah. about the milk, yeah. then, then they might believe me because, you know, it, it, it's just some, some lady in a grocery store that's trying to push her product. She might not be telling me the truth, but. So that's when they call you back and say, hey, um, maybe let's talk again and see yeah. if we can figure something out. Yep. And so, yep, we'd have more milk and more stores. So, but it took a long time. Yeah. So yeah, how is it, how is that doing now? What, what are people saying? What, once people started to catch on, what was the feedback that you were getting? Well, like today, um, we had a delivery and there was a man there that they drink exclusively my Shan dairy milk. Mm. And they said that their son had um, eczema mm. and his eczema is much better since he, since he drinks my Shan dairy milk. And that, but that is, that is something that's already been seen with A2 milk, um, that eczema is better, um, that, you can drink milk, you can have cereal, you can do whatever, you know, people make things with our milk, mm -hmm. make yogurt, make cheese, whatever they, you know, mm -hmm. because they tolerate it, so. So it's going well, people yeah. are catching on. They have caught on. And once you taste the flavor, you don't wanna go back. Mm. So it does taste different. It tastes different. Yeah, it's richer, it's sweeter, it's, yeah, it's hard to go to to different milk when you've when you've had it this way. And we so. talked about that in one of the earliest episodes of this podcast with a chef who listed my Shan milk. He liked to have like several different milks when he was making different things because of their different flavor qualities. And he talked about your milk specifically, I recall. Do some people say, ooh, this tastes different? Like, I'm not sure if I like well, that. When I, I haven't sampled since COVID, mm -hmm. um, but be previous, yeah. people would take a swallow and be like, oh, this tastes like what, what milk tastes like when I was a kid. And I'm like, yes, because we haven't, you know, we've, we haven't done a lot to it. Yeah. It's just. And it's probably creamier too, right? Yes, yes. What's been the hardest thing to get to this point? Fine. I'm sure there have been plenty of ups and downs. Oh, there's, yeah, there's everything. Um, regulations, mm. um, finding stores. I mean, there's just everything. Yeah. There's so many things that I can't even, where to start, you know? Yeah. Was it in 2013 that we wanted to start? <laughs> 2014, which, which problem, which year? Right. So right now, inflation. Mm. Inflation is probably our hardest, um, diesel prices, um, feed prices, everything. So when, say two years ago, sugar, a bag of sugar for our chocolate milk, mm -hmm. a 50 pound bag, <laughs> I was getting up for $22 a bag. It is now currently the same exact brand at the same exact store is $65. Yeah. Triple. Yeah. I mean, who can afford groceries nowadays? Right. It's inflation. And that's going to be a hard, the hard thing because, you know, a lot of people are in a more of a commodity system when they're growing food. Farmers, they have very little control, no control really over what they get paid right. for what they produce. I suppose you guys could say, well, we're going to jack up the price of our milk. But that probably has to also be in coordination with the retailers that yes. sell it. Yes, yes. It is. And then what will and, and people like, actually pay for it? Right. And then even if they will, do you want to be then adding to that inflation and making people's food cost more? Right. And it's a, it's a very difficult situation, but yeah. we also need to be able to pay for feed for the cows. Yep. You know, I have to make rent here. Um, yeah. Diesel, you know, to run the tractor to, to feed the cows. I mean, it's... It's one thing after another, but that I would say inflation right now is probably our most difficult, difficult what, thing. What should people who aren't around farming know about what it takes to bring milk or anything well, from farm here to the grocery store? It, 
it is a lot. It's 24 hours. You know, farmers, it's a lot of work. And people just don't understand. And farmers give their life. I mean, we don't, we don't spend a lot of time doing other things, going out <laughs> for dinner at night. Yeah. I mean, there's no time. Work to be done. It's, it's work and it's work at both businesses. Right. And then when you do get extra time, you want to sleep. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and spend time with the family. Where can people find your milk? Um, no. gro all the grocery outlets, um, I, I'm along the I-5 corridor mm -hmm. north of Linwood. Um, all the Hagens from here, from Bellingham, mm -hmm. Ferndale, all the way to Olympia. Mm -hmm. um, the food pavilions, any of the markets. Mm -hmm. And then there's just various stores, but you can find it on our website. There is a map on our website that has all our stores. So. Is it the kind of thing where if someone doesn't have it in the store that they go to, they can ask? Yes. Do you guys even are, do you have extra milk that yeah. you're trying to sell? Yep. If another store wants milk from us, yep. we're more than happy to bring more milk. To so just say, hey, yep. bring in that Myshan dairy milk. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Give these people a call. Google them. <laughs> yes, yes. So we're, we're more than willing to bring milk to another store. But milk goes out of here every single day of this week. I mean, of the week. Right. So. Crazy. Yep. Thank you so much for You're very welcome. having me here to the farm, showing Thanks me for around coming. and sharing this whole story. It's pretty fascinating and very unusual for a yes. variety of reasons. I mean, funeral director, farmer, that's pretty wild. But it is. starting a small family dairy farm in the 2000s, that's... That's crazy itself. Yeah. I had to be convinced. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty awesome to see and, and what you guys are doing here is very cool. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. These are the stories of the people who grow your food. 